Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Um, and I hope you all are doing great. Today, as I said, we'll be discussing our final project. And we have to, because of that, introduce ourselves to a new package because you'll be building some web-based visualization tool. So we have to introduce ourselves to a new package other than Folium. Um, you can use Folium in that package, but we have to um, see what that one too is. It will really help you later on if you want to do your own stuff as well. And that particular thing is called, uh, package is called um, Streamlit. So just, I don't know why it's always difficult for me to type in this big box here. Okay. It's called Streamlit, Stream L-I-T like that. You see, it says a faster way to build and share data apps. So let's go to their place and see. Why is this thing taking forever? Let me... Refresh it and see. Oh, let me perform a hot reload. I'm gonna check the strength of my signal. Um, please, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, I think my signal strength is strong, but I don't know why this website is not opening. Um, let me see if I can, for instance, let me open the documentation and see. It looks like it's loading, but it's only the loader that comes to the middle there like that. Okay, but the documentation has opened. Uh, but I wanted to show you the home page also. Okay, no problem, let us continue. Maybe at your end it will open. I don't know why it is not opening at my end. But if I... Okay. Let me try streamlate.io. Let me try it from here. Okay, now it has come. So this is the website streamlate.io. So it's a faster way to build and share data apps. Um, I found this thing not long ago, and I must say it's very, very, it's very nice. Maybe I should, I'm thinking of doing tutorials on it on my YouTube channel there. Uh, maybe for some data science, data analytics apps and stuff. It's just so, so cool. Like you can see, you, if you are building apps that deal with data, that is all that you have to do. And there are lots of plugins in there. If we come to, let's say the components, let me also open the documentation on one side. So you have all these components, some of them you have to install. Don't worry, I know they all look new and probably confusing. That is why we are organizing the session. I'll take you through the basic stuff, all that you have to do. And then if you care to, Explore, you can come to this side and see how you can use all of these to build very, very amazing um, data apps. So let's um, scroll down here. I think the way we get started is here. So get started in under a minute. 
So the first point is to install the streamlet locally. And we can do that by using the PIP command. And then they say we can run their hello app, which we will not do for now. Uh, we want to run our own app. And so let's, and you can see that it integrates seamlessly with pandas, even geopandas and other stuff. And these are some of the uh, widgets that you can use. We we'll get to explore all of them here like that. So the color picker, the file picker. Um, okay, you click on it and it even takes you to the documentation. That is great. Oh, wow. Wow. But we are exploring all of these things today, so don't worry. And then after that, you can also deploy. So this particular one is a, okay, it's showing a GIF, but it's a data that some uh, apps that somebody has deployed. Uh, but let's, 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 let's get started with it. So I'll bring up my terminal. Uh, maybe I should open it in, uh, let me maybe add it to, I'm thinking of adding it to my project or uh, at a different place, but no worries. Let me see. Okay. Let me open the terminal in my documents. So I'm doing that on the other screen, sorry, so if you are not seeing it. But this is my terminal inside my document. If I check the stuff in there. Oh, uh, okay, so these are the stuff in there. And I want to now maybe make a directory called um, streamlets. Streamlit apps, something like that. And then I'll see the into this um, Streamlit apps. Uh, I love to clear my terminal. And then here, I will, you can create a new virtual environment with Python to specifically store this, but you can also use your existing Conda environment. So I think instead of, creating a new environment and installing all the GeoPandas and other stuff, what I prefer to do is to um, capitalize on that environment that I have and then install Streamlit in that environment also. So I can just say Conda activate and then I think it's called Geospatial. Geo Special. Okay, if you're on Windows, you see my own, I just came into the directory and then the Conda activate Geospatial and it activated it for me. But yes, that, will, that will may not be the case. If you are on Windows, you may want to go to the, the search bar, or the task bar, search for the Anaconda prompt. And then when you are done, you go to the place where you want to create the, the app in this, in my case, you see this is the folder I'm creating the app in. And at the Windows address bar, which is similar to this one, you can click on it once, it will highlight the path for you and then you can copy that path. And then when you copy that path, what you do is that after you have activated your environment inside the Anaconda prompt using Conda Activator and whatever environment name, okay. Then you can do CD and then paste the path in there. So let's say the path in my case is um, here like um, slash documents, documents, and slash streamlit apps. So that path that you copy, then you paste it in there so that it will take you to this particular directory. It is very necessary that the environment that has streamlit installed uh, you will be running the app from the terminal. And so the environment that has a streamlit installed, in our case, Geospatial, I have not installed it. We are now about to install it. Everything is coming to start from scratch. And so I'm just hoping that you will not get many errors or any errors for that matter. Uh, 
Um, it's not really an easy thing to try and code live, especially if you are getting errors as well. So I will install it in the geospatial, but when we are running the app, we will not run it in Python, uh, in VS Code like we've been doing. We will run it in the terminal here. So it is very important that you are located in that folder or your terminal is opened in that folder. So just copy the path. After you activate your environment, just do CD, which is change directory, and then paste the environment there. You can paste in the Windows prompt by right-clicking. Um, just when you right-click, it will paste what you have copied there for you. OK. And so this says we should do pip install. Sorry. Install, and then we install streamlet. I'm just trying to make you see my. The commands I typed, that is why I'm zooming in so much. But this is the command I typed pip install streamlet. And then it has installed it for me already. Um, did I install it already? I think I did. Sorry, I said I did not. I've been bouncing between Windows and Linux, so this confusion is bound to happen. Now I have Streamlit here. And so what I can do is that I open this folder up in VS Code. I've been showing you that you can drag and drop the folder into VS Code. Another way to open it in the terminal is to type code and then dots. When you type code dots, what you are saying is that open Visual Studio Code in this directory. Remember, we have been using the dots notation to represent the parent directory where the current file that is being run is. So if I do code dot and I press enter, um, what will happen is that VS code will be opened for me in that directory. So you see here that it has opened Streamlit apps. I was expecting that it asked me to trust this. So yes, trust it. And then this time around, we will not be creating interactive um, notebooks. So what we will do is that uh, we'll create the actual PY file. So you saw that I've created a new file which I'll call maybe main.py. You can give it any name you want. Uh, let me try and then make this big. Okay. And it's also easy to build an interactive, uh, like uh, this dashboard and this data tabs. It's just so easy. So let me show you how. First, I want to ensure, and usually if you open a VS code from a terminal, then the Python version that you're using in that terminal will be automatically detected by VS code. In this case, you can see down here that I detected from my geospatial environment. It is very necessary because if the right Python is not detected, you may not have um, IntelliSense working for you, even though your code may work and because you are running it from the terminal, not from this editor itself. Uh, but in any case, try and use code dot to open VS code in that directory. So all I have to do is to say import streamlet, streamlet as usually as st. Oh, I'm not I'm not doing Django, sorry. And then yes, I've built an app, obviously, but I have to put something there. So I can say st dot um, title. I think there's some title there. Then I put a title here. Hey, oh, this intelligence. This is, oh, come on. My first maybe dashboard. You can do more than a dashboard, but I'll save the file. And then how do we show this in our browser? You come back to your terminal. And then if I list, you see that I have only the main.py file. So what you do is to say streamlet run, and then the name of the file, which in this case is main.py. Don't forget the .py, it is very important. And so if you have multiple files in there, you can choose which one to run. If I press enter now, you can see that I can view my Streamlit app in my browser using this URL. 
and um, this also network URL. But usually you want you'll want to hit this local host. You don't want uh, so much problems. So I can do control and click, and it will open for me. And I think it may have even opened in the background. Oh yeah, it has. So this is it. Hey, this is my first dashboard. Uh, and is this one not cool? I mean, it's just so, so cool. It's just so, so cool. So if I go back to my editor and make changes, when I come here, I'll see it. But what I want to do is to keep my editor by the side and then this one to by the side. This one like that. And then where is my editor? Also by the side, but that will mean that I will have to really decrease the size of my text. But I just, I just still hope that you see. Let me try and make this one rather small. Um, if the text is small, you can drop it in the comments so that I increase it up a bit. But this is it. If I change this hey to just one Y and I hit save, which is Control S for today. I have turned off my auto save. So it is not auto saving for me. I want to be manually hitting control S. And this is because of the rerunning of this um, folio. Because um, it's automatically, it can automatically update itself to when you make changes to your script, it can rerun the app to keep it alive. And so I want to manually hit control S so that I don't. Um, Kind of make a lot of make that a uh, rerun uh, API do a lot of work. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense. So this is it, and this is a title. Usually that renders to big text like this. In fact, if you want to write a markdown, if you are experienced in that, you can write a markdown test here in it, and it will also work. Okay, sorry, I did not mean for you to see that. Um, that was my, that was my note that just um, flashed by, uh, but I did not mean for you to see it. Sorry. Okay. And so I can also go ahead and add other things like test. This is a title, so usually a big test. So I can give a comment here like title. If I go ahead and say text, I can just say st.text. And then I can say here that, um, hello, hello, friends. OK, this thing should be a string. And then I hit, now you know that it's not C because of the dots here. If I hit Control or Command S, I still don't see the changes. In fact, it is still in the very old one. But if you look at the top right here, it says source file is changed. I can choose to rerun it once, always rerun or deploy. It will come to this deploy later. And there's another pop up here. We like clearing the cache and all that, we get to know what the cache is. But if you choose this always rerun, then it means that anytime you make changes to your source code, like this file, and then you, you save it with Control or Command S, the changes will reflect. So now when I hit it, you see the hello friends over there. So now if I make any changes because I chose rerun, it will automatically update for me. And this is so, so cool. OK. And if you think this is cool, then just uh, wait a bit and let me show you a very, another even more interesting stuff. So um, unfortunately I have to be switching between making it small and large. It comes out of the box with some cool layout structures. I don't know whether they are here. Um, how easy I can find them here for you. Where is that? And usually, the documentation. Okay. okay. Sometimes it takes time to find these things, but um, 
I think to get started with what I'm showing you here, or what I have in my notes here, um, should keep you going and then you can come here and explore it. I'll not spend the time looking for the components, but they are here somewhere. They are here. I think when I click this, it took me to a particular page. So it's under the develop and then you can come to input widgets. So you can see them here. It has rights and magic, which is the ones that we are exploring now. So the ones that we've done is the, why does this thing keep um, collapsing? So this is the st. Dot. Okay, we did not really use the st. Dot right. What we are using is the st. Dot title, but uh, that one too, it, that's really something like that. So it's right arguments to the app. We will use it very soon. And there's right stream and all that. So there's text elements. I think those are the ones that we have explored. We have the title, we have the header, and all of that. So you can explore these um, by going to docs.streamlit.io. But let us see some of the cool features that I think are necessary for you to um, do the uh, project, especially the st.data frame. We'll be using that one. Um, which one is this data data? I didn't really go into that 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 one. So see that they even have examples in here. I was expecting this thing to show. Okay. Oh wow, this is cool. <laughs> I think I have to explore this one further. Like I just saw it not long ago. I was really looking at how to make you do the web app. Um, and I was looking at Folium and all those ones, but I found out that this one is way, way better. Okay. So there is a way to even lay out our stuff. And this one is from layouts and containers. If you are a bit into web development, this should be very, very fun. Uh, but if you are not, that shouldn't also be a problem. There is a sidebar here that we can use. You saw that there are tabs that we can use, but for now we will explore the sidebar. So I will come back here, make it a bit small. And then, now you see it says that the title is main. Um, I don't want that, so what I can do is to say st. Dot, um, set page configuration, this one. And then here I can set a couple of stuff. So uh, you see that I can set the page title, page icon. If I have another icon I want to use instead of this, um, the streamlit icon. So now let's say the title for now. I'll let that equal to my awesome, awesome dashboard. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, it's page title, page underscore title. So when I say, now you see that it has changed from main to uh, my awesome dashboard. So if you want to do something like that, that is how you do it. If you have an icon, you can pass the icon in as uh, your, your apps icon. But what I wanted to show is the sidebar. And if you want to add a sidebar, it's as simple as saying that st dot sidebar sidebar. Um, let's add a title to our sidebar, and then we can see here my app sidebar. And immediately when I saved my file, you've seen that there's this try, uh, this icon here. It was not there at first. If I comment this one out, see that it is missing. But if I bring it back, save it, you see that this sidebar, this is this uh, framework, this streamlet is just so, so cool. Uh, just so cool. It makes you do the difficult things in just a few lines of code. And if you're into web development, you understand how this thing is making your life so, so easy. So I just have, I have this, my sidebar that I can add things to. 
I can write in here. So let's use the right here, the right that we saw there. Let's um, implement it here as an example. So I can say st dot sidebar dot right, and I can say this text goes into the sidebar. I save it, and then it's in here like this. Okay. So that is it. You can add a sidebar like this and so, so simple in so, so like just one line of code. There are other ones too that we'll explore like the container and all that. Um, take that one as a div if you are coming from the web development side. Um, if you're not coming from that, please just think of the container as a, just a section of the web, website that you want to put something so now let's look at a few of the widgets that uh, Streamlit can give us. So what are the stuff that we can use? Well, I'll take you to the common widgets, which I believe will be beneficial for you, for, to be, for you to do your final project. And so this one is, uh, if I want to put a text widget, I will say st dot or let me just say input widgets to so st dot um, that that should be text input yes and then I can give uh, if I save it now honestly okay it's missing one one required positional argument so I have to give it a label which is um, maybe type your name something like that and then here I have my text inputs. As simple as that. So I type my name, Tommy. And then I press enter. I say press enter to apply. So I press enter. And it does apply. Uh, but I will not see it here because I am not returning it in, in any way. So if I want to get the value of this or whatever the user types in and return it, I have to assign it to a variable. And in case you want to um, give a placeholder for this. You can equally, I think there's an option for that. Okay, uh, the value, no, you're not, we are not putting the value there. I was looking at something like a placeholder. Okay, yes, there is. So I can say placeholder, maybe type your name. I save it, and then that one too is there. But usually, if you have the label, the placeholder, uh, it's not really necessary. And so, as I was saying, if I make this a bit small, if I want to return the value here, I can just assign it to a variable and say name equal to. So, once I say name equal to whatever I type inside this, when I hit enter, it will be stored in this name variable. And how do we know? We can actually decide to print um, name, but in a more, in a, a little bit of a fancy way. So you type, and then using an F string, I can say name as your name. Okay, I've saved it. So I can here come and say Tommy. But before I press enter, I'll bring up my terminal. Try and, oh. How did it pick it without me typing or hitting enter? Okay, so you see that anytime I hit enter, uh, the, the thing comes in, in my terminal. So we can get this name and use it anywhere in our code that we like. Okay. And so that is the text input widget. There is also be the slider. This is a text input widget. So there should also be a slider. And then here, what I can do, you know that I can assign it to a variable. So I will straight ahead, go ahead and say that a number, that should be equal to st dot slider and then this slider i can see the label is
Okay. Label is oh, I, instead of bringing label label, I can just um put things here. But it's it's good to let your uh, type proper code. So something like this, I can say select a number or something like that. And then in here for the slider, there are a couple of things that I can also pass. You see that after the label, there's min value, there's max value, and there's the current value, and then the step. So let me bring them on separate lines and see that the main value, that should be zero, and then max value, that should be, say, maybe 100. Let me give a current value of 10, and then a step. The, the, the step is just, when I move the slider handle, how much in value should it move? So I say a step maybe equals um, five because I don't want it. And now I have this beautiful slider here. I can drag and I have my value. I can drag and have my value. So let me even make it a bit fancy. I think we can do st dot right uh, not st comma right st dot right and let's assume that this is a volume so or not even a volume uh, in an f string i can say your current number is and then i'll plug it in here which is number save and then my current number is five See how it automatically updates as soon as I release the slider. So that is it also for the slider. And it's so, so cool. Like this stream late is actually late. It's so, so cool. And then after the slider, there is also some things like the select box, which is a drop down. And that one in particular, I think you need it. So. Um, let me come here and then I'll say options. Those are the options I'll pass to my Dropbox. So options, that should be equal to um, maybe you can just put first, second, third. Okay. And then we can see um, maybe um, option rather now equal to st dot select box, and then in here I see maybe the label. Uh, let let's make that one maybe choose an option or choose an option. And then I can see here that I think it's the options. Options equal to options. And then we can do an st dot write that says and in an f string like you chose. And then we can pass in the user's uh, option here. I save it, and I see my drop down here. If I click this, I see first, second. If I choose, say you choose um, second, choose third. But you saw that if I first rerun this app, you see uh, by refreshing it at the top there. First is chosen as default. So if I don't want anything chosen as default. I can put an empty string here. When I save, okay, now I have to hit always rerun because it's assuming I'm running it for the first time. So, and then I can do that. But I can even make this a bit fancier by saying that um, if option, this is Python, so you can do all your Python stuff. If option, it's not, um, it's not 
equal to an empty string, then and only then I want this thing to show. So if I save it, it goes away. But as soon as I choose a valid value, I see it there. If I choose an invalid value, it goes away. Okay. Um, once again, if you have questions, I'll, I'm monitoring the studio as well, so you can drop them there. And then I will address them. But I think you, sh you, <laughs> you should be enjoying it because um, this thing looks so, so fun. And there's also the checkbox option. I don't know whether you use it. And so let me... And um, I forgot to mention, we can put all of these things in the sidebar. I think we have neglected it for a while. But if I just should put dot sidebar here, I think you should move it from my regular uh, face to the sidebar. So it's just as simple as that. So if you want it to go to the sidebar, just do st.sidebar, and it goes there. Other than that, it goes in the um, mainstream like that. Okay. And then um, let's work on a checkbox. Checkbox. So that's one too. Let's just see ST but, um, checkbox here. And then I can see maybe this one, the label will be say show secret message, something like that. And so when I click on this, I think this one should evaluate to true and false. Let me just say, um, show equal to and then do an st dot write and see st dot write let's only write show that so that it's a value that is being passed. okay so you can see that it's either true or false so when i check it it is true when i when it's unchecked it is false uh i think this one has an option that it may allow you to um the value option allows you to make it true or false by default when it starts so I can say if show, this is a purely Python syntax, which means that if the show value is true, you can say if show is true, but a simpler way is to just say if show, then you can say maybe st.write, let's write our secret message. So a yeah, very secret message. So that message will, show even only if this is true yeah but as i told you also you can get away uh, get rid of this is true uh, my app did not rerun and it will still work again okay uh, now we will look at working with data frames and data tables. So um, I guess up to this point, there is no confusion. So what I'll do is, I don't know how to spam this, but I don't want to be scrolling up and down in this page also. So what I'll do is, I'll delete this one, and then um, Maybe I'll give a proper title here. So data frames and data tables. Maybe you'll be looking at the data frames so you explore the data tables yourself. Okay. So I have here um, a dummy data frame. So let me um, copy it from my notes and paste it. The goal is not for you to watch me type. So this is uh, my data frame. So you know of the back that I have to import pandas as PD. I know this is not new to you, even though we did geo data frame and not data frames, but this should not be new to you. All that is happening here is that 
I have, think of it like the table. I have a table with two columns, name and age. And then for the names, so in the first row in the name, I have Alice, the second one, Bob, the third one, Charlie, and they are corresponding ages. So it's a simple part, uh, pandas data frame. And so if I now say here is a simple data frame, well, you can read this data frame too from a, a, a CSV file or a, a shape file, a JoJSON, anything that JoPandas can read. And so if I want to display this, my tabular data, all I do is to say st dot data frame, and then I pass in the data, which is df. Now look at the magic when I save it. I have my table here. I can download the table. I can perform a search on it. So if I come here and see, OK, let me try and expand it. Let me search for Alice. OK, where, where is this um, thing going? OK, the, the cursor just comes and vanishes. I don't know why. OK, OK, OK. So when I search for Alice and press enter, it took me to this place. Let me search for Charlie and see. You see that Charlie is now highlighted, but I can't see the test I'm typing. That is the issue. If I if we try Bob, I tried Bob, and it's highlighted that one also, 22, and it got to the 22. You can see the colors are highlighting over there. I don't know why. It is not really. Let me see. Um, maybe we should set the layout to white. So let me go to... Or we can pass a width. Let, let's see the... So let's see the width and height. We can pass those two values. So what I'll do is to say width. Let me make this thing 500. I don't really care about the height. So when I make the width 500 now, it's a bit wider, I think now. Oh, yes, now I can see what I'm searching for. So what I was searching for is to maybe get Alice. And then you see that um, it's just in there. Is this not just that cool? Is This is just so, so cool. And um, it will make life a lot easier for you if we work with data, you want to build data apps. And yes, so this is it. I think I did not want the index to show. Dots. Will drop. Oh, you let me leave it. Let me leave it. Um, let me leave it. Uh, no problem. Or I can maybe say here that df dot set index. Sorry, set index, and I and I will set it to maybe the name column. But I don't think that is also necessary. It's just to show you how the data frames come. If you don't want it, you can drop that index column, and then um, have your table as it is. Okay. And. I uh, found out here that I think we can add some bits of interactivity to it. Let me see DF dot um, style dot style highlights style. Uh, is it highlights max or something like that? Highlights. Okay. So if you want to perform some styling, okay. Unable to convert. Okay, 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 okay. Um, I have to provide the axis here. So this is zero. Uh, okay, I will have to be zooming in and out in the text, forgive me. So I just wanted to give some styling to my table. And the styling that I wanted to give is to highlight the maximum number for every column uh, you can see that it is saying that charlie is the maximum uh, well i'm sure it is sorting the strings alphabetically so in that sense in that way it makes sense so uh, if i go to the highlight min that one too this is not streamlit specific this is purely pandas specific so um, but you may not need that one it's not necessary 
But in case you have a data table, you want to show the maximum, then you can use that one. Okay. Okay, so back to what it was. And then let's now explore um, charts and visualizations also. So let's just say that I want to generate some random charts. We'll get to working with our own data very soon, but I just want to show you the basics of stuff. So I want to import NumPy, S, and P. And then here, what I'll do is I'll copy this, come here, and then this is charts. Okay. So I can come in here and then see the data for the charts. No, I already have a data. So maybe let me call it charts data. And that should be equal to, I want some random numbers. So np dot random dot rand n. Uh, I know we've been using the rand int, rand int, but today we are using the rand n. So it just returns a sample from the standard normal distribution. Okay. And then I, let me just put 10 here and then two. Okay. Where is this? Okay, so I'm supposed to plot it. So that'll be st dot line. I think it's line chart. And then I pass in my chart data like that, and I save it. And you can see that it has given me my chart here. It has given me my chart. It's just so, so simple to do these things. So, so simple. And if it's a, if it's a line chart, uh, this is a line chart. If it is a bar chart that I wanted, I can see st.bar chart. And then I pass in my chart data. If I save it, you can see here that my bar chart is also here. And then if you hover over each of them, there are lots of customizations that you can do. And I know I've taught you how to explore these things and read around them. So if you want to change the color, the width, the height, and other stuff, you can do that. But it's just also that easy, um, creating this kind of visualizations. It's even, it's even interactive. I can zoom in and out and I just really appreciate the work that this Streamly team are doing because it will usually cost you a lot of <laughs> man hours to build something like this to work in the browser. Okay. And so we can even also, um, if you don't like this default one that Streamly provides, you can bring in your own matplotlib. You know, you want to plot it your own style with matplotlib, you can do that. You can easily do that. So um, let me import matplotlib at the top here. So import matplotlib. Um, run the pyplot, so dot pyplot as plt. And so when I come down, maybe I can see st dot title. And then see mat plot lib charts. Okay. Here I will declare a figure and an axis, and I set the two equal to plt dot sub plots. Not single sub plot, sub plots. Let me bring the uh, the font up a bit. And then here, um, 
I can say that for on this particular axis, I want to say plot and then two random values. This thing should not be popping up like that. So one, two. Let me just copy this one here and then paste it in here. So this is just what I want to plot. And then, you know, in Matplotlib, you have to say plt.show before it shows it for you. Well, um, Streamly supports Matplotlib, but you have to say st.pyplot. And then you pass in the figure, the figure. Remember, oh, this thing. It is the figure that is showing, but you are plotting on a particular axis. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't just say that show the axis. You have to show the figure because it's the figure that contains the axis. If I save this, you have your traditional math plot lip charts inside here in your app. Okay. Um, any questions? Let me check. Okay, there are no questions, and I think. Um, it is really going um, smoothly, and that is good to know. Okay, so I think we have to now see how we can um, maybe import our own data. Um, but first, I would like to um, let me clear this again. Um, I think we have been doing a lot of stuff, but what about a map? In case you want to um, show your own map in there, how do you do it? So these ones, you don't need them now. But let's import GeoPandas as GPD. OK. And then here, let me see, showing maps. So everything comes down to this simple showing maps. And then this place I can say that, um, let's use the inbuilt GeoPandas data set so world, which is a natural earth world data set that is in the GeoPandas, equal to gpd.read file. And then what we want to read is gpd. I, I like the intelligence and all this, but the way it pops up when I'm typing, I don't really like it at all. So maybe I can say file equal to gpd dot um, data sets dot get underscore path. The path I want to get is the one for the natural earth underscore low resolution. So you've seen this syntax during the training, so it shouldn't be something new. And now that I have this, my world data like this, all that I have to do to show a map is to say st.map. And oh yes, it has a support just simple like that and you pass in your data, which is world. If I save it, um, okay, it says what? Map data must contain latitude, a latitude column named latitude. Oh, OK. So it, it looks like we have to modify this world data set a bit. Streamlit wants to explicitly see latitude or lats. Uh, but uh, it says there that the existing columns were just uh, geometry and the other ones. So we can modify that, you know, we can do that easily. So we can say that world, and then let's pick its suggestion. So say lat equal to world dot geometry, geometry dot x. And then we can say that, um, let me copy this. That be world and this be long. And then geometry dot y. If we save it, 
Okay, okay, okay. So um, that one is only valid for point geometries. Okay, okay. I get it now. I think I do get it now. So um, I think we have to show it with a folium inside here uh, because it, it's, it's looking for latitude and longitude to do the plotting. But in that case, it's either we have it in, how do we get it? Because a polygon have many longitudes and latitudes. Okay, I think I even made a typo here. Polygon has many longitudes and latitudes. Now, if it were a point, I think it will be, do they have something like cities? Maybe. Yes, it's called natural earth cities. So let's see how that one will go. And in fact, that one, I don't really think we have to do this we are doing here. Okay, we still have to do it. Okay, it doesn't want G as part of the longitude. Oh. Okay, so after a bit of a struggle, we we have our, our map showing here like this. But this map is not, uh, it's provided by Mapbox. It's also one map service. So you can see it here. It's also so interactive. So it's also that easy to add your maps in here like that. But if we want to add polygons or maybe lines, then we may have to rely on folium so that we can add GeoJSON layers. It's as easy like that. Okay. So let us see how we can um, add the folium to it. Okay, for that one, let us come back to our terminal and I'll do control C or command C to break out of it. You see that now it says stopping and it has stopped. Um, I wanted to say clear. Okay. We have to install a particular package also called ST folio. So that one to go PIP install is the support for folio. So ST underscore folio. I think I should already have it installed. Um, is it ST folio or stream lit folio? Um, I made another typo there. Okay, so that one too is installed for us and then we can come back to okay we can come back to our editor here and he's saying that there's a connection error that is true let's bring up our app let's pin it up again so that is this one streamlit run main.py Um, it has opened another instance, so let me just get this one off. Okay. So now we have this. Uh, let us see. For your project, you will have to create um, a dashboard or maybe a web app. I don't know how to call it, but something like a dashboard. It will have a map. It will also have some charts. And what we are using is some world population data set from Kaggle. If you don't have an account, it's free. Once I think once you have a Google account, you can easily do that there. And then um, I think I'm, should I show the, the demo I have here? Because I want it to be unique. I will not really put emphasis on the design, but if your, your thing is also catchy and user-friendly, of course that should, Fetch you some extra max. Um, but 
think let me try and open the one that I built here and then see. So um, give me a minute. Let me open it from this side. Um, <laughs> how do I? I don't want to show the source code in in the live stream, um, but. Um, man, new or something like that. Uh, but if I I've added it off stream, so if I stop and I go ahead and run main new dot py, I open this up. Uh, Okay, okay, okay. Um, I'm using another library in there called Plotly just to make my plots a bit nicer. You don't really need it, but let me install it. Install Plotly. I'm not restricting it to the packages to use as long as it works fine. This Plotly is also one of the um, libraries you can use to generate very nice plots in Python. Okay, I'm hoping it will not take long. Um, okay, Okay. I still think I made some changes to this thing that it may not really call to run. Let me try it and see if it does. Okay. Um, so one, the file is not found because I did not copy it over. Uh, well, um, I'm sorry about that. Um, I built that one on Windows, and I'm trying to copy the file over to Linux. Um, but I will probably do a short demo on how that one should look like and upload it or prepare a document. Of course, you should have a document that tells you what to do. If you have been visit if you have visited the GitHub repository, you see that I've posted the data for the project there. So I will now teach you how you can fetch a file from a URL and work with it in your app. So this URL is um, just the GitHub repository that contains all of the stuff that we did in our 12 days. Um, as I said, the link to all of them is in each video's description. You can find it there. And um, that one is also taking forever to load. And so let's come here. Maybe get rid of this and then see how we can work with our own data. Also, this data set from Kaggle or Kaggle, or whichever name is correct, that is what you will be using in your work. Um, please make sure you reference it. So, this is the GitHub repository. You see, there is 13 final project data. It was added not long ago. The details.txt file gives credit to where the data in the folder was gotten from. And then um, this world geojson and the world population.csv. Now, if I click on the file like this, I will see this here. I, once I, I downloaded this from Kaggle and 
I just thought that I should put it here so that uh, we can all have access to it and know that at least we are all working with the same file. And so I wanted to get the download URL, but I think I can copy it from here, straightforward. So this is the data set. I'll link it in the video description so you can read about it. Okay, it's just a world population data set containing the population for um, several years. I think for 2020, there's 2015, 2010 and all that. So um, I'm sorry, I will upload a demo of the app, how yours is supposed to function so that you can know how to build with it. So let's focus this session on learning Streamlit. So now that I have this um, here, what I want to do is to read this um, CSV file. So I'll define a function, maybe get data. And yeah, I don't need to pass in anything. So I can say URL, URL equal to this. It's just the URL from the GitHub that I copied. Nothing special about that. You just come there and click in the address bar and copy the URL. And pandas, just like GeoPandas, is also able to read URL. So uh, we don't have pandas imported. So import pandas as PD. And so what I can do is to say that data should be equal to, or maybe DF, uh, let me increase it a bit. That should be equal to pd.read underscore CSV. And then I can say URL. And here, return the DF. I could have easily said return pd.read CSV URL also. And so if I want to work with this in my Streamlit app, is it my server up and running? No. Um, I'm not running the main new, I'm running the main.py now. Okay, so that one is here. Okay. It's still using the old file because I've not saved it. Now when I save it, I go to always rerun. Um, okay. Maybe getting data should be the proper. Title. Now, do you remember our st dot data frame? So now we can say data equal to get data. We call our function, and then we say st dot data frame. What is this data editor? I've not really tried this one. Let me, out of curiosity, pass in data and see. Mm -hmm. See what, what will happen here. So, error tokenizing data. Um, I don't know whether it's from the data editor. Let me just go back to data frame and see. So, if I save this and I get the same error, then that means it should be coming from our URL. What is the error saying? Okay, um, usually, I don't know whether this is the, that is the issue, but sometimes you rather have to, instead of www.github.com, what you have to do is say raw, if the file is coming from GitHub, dot GitHub um, user content, like that, so instead of github.com, just say raw.github.usercontent.com and then the rest of the URL follows. And I think that one fetches the data properly. Okay, so it's still running. I'm just hoping that this time around it is fetching the data.
So temporary failure in name resolution. Now we have a URL. Error. Okay. Um, let's try some, try accept blocks and see how that one goes. Uh, let me, or let me convert this one to a formatted string and Maybe is it because it's being so dependent on here? So I can put a conditional and say if data is not none, then show this. Else st dot write. And then I want you to write um, fetching data. Da, da, da. Okay. Um, 404, not found. What is wrong with our URL? I don't think there's anything wrong with this URL, too. GitHub user content dot com slash that is the correct URL. Save again. Okay. Let me come back to GitHub. Copy this one and see. Oh, let me try. Let me put this one in a try accept block. So the URL is there, and then the fetching should be in a try accept block. So X, and then here I can say try, and then. I'll read it and then return it. And it was giving some exceptions, so I can say accept exception as e. Let me catch it as e, and then I'll say um, maybe st dot error. There's that error component also in there that um, I can pass in, and then I can say. Um error occurred and then pass in E. And then in that case, I will return none. Okay, so I think this is a safer code. Okay, so an error occurred. It did found not found. I don't know why it's saying found not found, but that is the correct URL. Okay, um, I think this is the URL we are looking for. So when you come, just um, click on the row like this, and that should give us this um, URL here. So if I copy that raw URL, and then I now come back to this place, and then replace it here. Save. Okay, now it's fetched. So um, instead of just appending the raw GitHub user content directly, just click on this place that says raw, and then you can get the raw URL that will really um, fetch the file for you. Okay, so now I can see that the data is displayed here. If I maximize this for a minute, you see that this is all my data set. That's all that you are working with. Let me maximize this. OK, it's still not taking the full screen. Uh, there's a width component that we can pass. So you can pass the width.
let's say 700. That'll make it fair. Okay. Okay, but that's the table. But we will not be displaying the table actually. We will be using this column. So as I said, um, I will have to now um, get the data and then um, see how I can modify it and then make it work. But I'll do a demo for you. I'll not forget that one. So what you'll be doing is that you will show the country. So you get a country and then you will probably also plot some charts for me. So you can see there's the 2022 population, there is the 2020 population, there's the 2015 population and other stuff like that. So uh, let me, I'm not trying to do the work for you, but at least let me show you that if you have a data like this, how, how do you um, get the data from this and then, uh, what do you call it? Uh, use it in your code. So one of the great practices too, if we are using Streamlit, I told you that I'll show you what this cache does. This is a cache. Think of it less technically like a memory somewhere that you can keep stuff, st some stuff in there so that if you need them again, you don't have to call them again from the internet. This file is being read from the internet. So what happens is that anytime I hit Control S, this is not even a big file, but anytime I make a change here and I hit control S, this data is fetched from the internet. But because the file size is very small, you don't really see it. But if the file size is huge, like in megabytes and several megabytes, you will see that your app will always load slowly. So one of the things is to, like this data that doesn't change, is to cache it. So what I'll say is at st dot cache data so cache data like that. And in part one, you prepend with the uh, at symbol is a <clears throat> that is a decorator. Sorry, that is a decorator. So what happens is that this one has been fetched in memory, and if we rerun our app, it will not be fetching it again because it already has it existing in memory. Okay, so let's just say that we want to, we are not showing a data frame, but we will, we want to maybe create some plots. And so um, I will keep my code safe and put it in here. One of the things I also did not show you is that you can use some layouts to make your thing look very, very nice. And for instance, one of them is the, uh, I show you the container. I didn't, I don't think I showed you the container, but you can use the container to make your app very, very neat. And also you can use um, columns. And so that one too, you can see that um, the columns, it depends on the number of columns you want to create. You saw that anytime I was adding things, it was adding it like, top to bottom, but if you want to do it right to left, or sorry, left to right, you can use columns. So I can say column one, column two, because I want two columns, and that should be equal to st.columns, that is here, and in here, uh, you can specify gap and stuff, but I want to show you something. If I want the column to be 50, 50, I can put here in a square bracket one comma one. That means that left and right should have the same size. They should divide the screen into two. But if I want the, if you are coming from the web development environment, think of it like you are using a flex box to, divide your page or a, a, a div or a section. So you can use give a flex of maybe five and two. That means that the screen should be rendered into seven sections and then five given to the first one, two given to the second one. So if I do this one like three and one, I leave it like this. That means that in those two columns, 
uh, let's try and put things in there so that uh, uh, you get to understand it better. So I can say now, um, let me say with column one, and I don't even need a width. So I can say column one dot maybe title. That means I want to, uh, maybe a title will be too big. Let's choose the right. And then you can now say this, or let me just, just say this is so column one. And then I can do same for column two. So if I want to put something in column two, I just say column two dots and I put it in. If I save it now, you see that I have my, day, uh, my, my stuff in column left and right. But if I put something now beneath it, another st dot right. So this ones will now be st. Let me just put here next, and this is uh, next one. See that now those ones are rendered um, from top to bottom, sort of left to right, and the column because I want to put it in columns, it's, um, it's done it for me in left and right. Okay. I wanted to show you that one. And the division is three is to one. Or it is four, but three is given to column one, and then one is given to column two. Okay. So what I want to do now is to get a select box here in column one. So column one should be small, one rather. Okay, I can maintain it that way and start working on column two rather. So I can see column two dot um, right. And then here I can see select a country. Is there any way we can apply colors to these things? Maybe you can check the, the, the sites, the documentation. So select a country and obviously know that I'm coming to use uh, that select, uh, what is more like, what is called a drop down menu, but I think we call it a select box here. So I can say um, column two dot um, select box. Yep, this one. And then I can give a label of this one, you are coming to select a country. So select a country. And then I pass in options. So now here are my options. Remember the data is the one we have gotten from this CSV file. So data options equal to, and then I want data where the column, I think the column is country. Let me, instead of using, let me now come and get it from here. Uh, okay, it's called country or territory. So let me copy that one and then paste it in. Now, when I come back and save it, you see that I have all the countries in there. So, and it's also support search automatically. So if I put GH here, you see that all of them that have GH are popping up. So I can put GH and select Ghana here. As easy as that. And then I think I will need to make this thing two is two. Or one is two, one. Or maybe two is two, one. It looks like the other part is just so small. Okay, now I have it a little bit bigger. Okay, that's my selected country was not even necessary. And then now we want to we want to plot some bar chart of the population for some of the years. So let's randomly pick. Um, okay, um, should I do this? Because if I do that, then I'm really doing the assignment for you. So let me find another way of doing it without doing it for you. And so I can now say that uh, let me pass this one in as a country. 
and then I'll use this country. You know that it will return that value for me. So I will now say. Um, if country, I only want this thing to show if there is a country, or if country is not none, then and then I want to, uh, let me see. Okay, I only plot two at least so that it will make some comparison, maybe the 2022 population and the 2020 population. Okay. So that one I can say selection equal to DF. And then I'll select um, DF. Uh, did you call it DF or data? Sorry, data. You know this querying methods already, so I'll not um, worry myself with it. And I, I want the 2020 population, and I think it, there was 2020 also. Uh, let me, I think there's an, a very older one, 1970, yeah. Let me pick the 1970 population. So, it is more reasonable to bring the earlier one first. So I want to do this selection from the data set. Uh, let me squeeze this one now. Okay, so I've gotten this selection, then I want to now do st dot bar, bar chart, and then I pass in the data as selection. Okay. It says Boolean array expected for what? Okay, so which line is causing the error? Not in 64. And this error code is not really being so helpful here. Okay, let me... If I choose to, well, let, let me just um, select the 19, maybe 2020 population and see if whether the error is coming from here. 2020, 2020 population. Okay, so the error is coming from the way I'm querying my data there. Okay, uh, let me see something. I'm not doing something right here. Okay, so I think what I want to do is to create the data frame myself. 
is to create the data frame myself. And in that case, I have to get the data for the particular country first. What I'm doing now is a bit confusing. So the data for the particular country, let me call it country data, and then set that one equal to data. And then inside the data, so I want to fetch where the I think it's called a country or territory equal to and this is not JavaScript, double equal sign, equal to country. So I want to get a population for that country. And then I want to use the index location to get it. So that will give me all the data for that country. Yeah. But I don't need all the data too for that country. So what I want to do is just to plot the two um, years of the population. So this is my selecting or selection here. Uh, let me see. Selected years, or let me make this one a dictionary so that I can convert into a data frame easily. There might be an easier way to do this, maybe you know, but um, for now, let me do it this way because I, the way I want it to appear in the chat. So the year will be the year column in the chat, and in that one, I want. Um, the which pop, which one did we pick? I think we picked the 1970 population. And then we also have the, let's say the 2020 population. And then for the population column, on my chat population, I just want like to capitalize stuff. So that's one. Now that I've selected the data for the particular country that the user selected, now I have to. What I want to do now is to loop through all the columns and then select those years. So I will use this year. Uh, so what I can do now is to, because I want to use it as a variable, maybe I can say target years, and set that one in here. So I can put a year here as um, target years, okay. And then here I can see, I can use this once and then map them, map through them and fetch data for them and store them in this list here. So I can see um, country data and then the, the um, maybe year, let me put it that way, for year in target underscore years. Um, this should not be a difficult syntax to understand. What I'm doing here is that I've already selected the data for the particular country here. So of all the data sets in the world, this one will look through the country and territory column and get me the data for that year or the country where the user selected, in this case, Ghana. And then these are the, my target uh, population. But for yours, you may have to show a lot more than that. And um, when I'm reviewing your code, I even don't like to see something like this. I want you to, to call it the columns like I've, I've called them here. Okay. And then this selection here is a, it's a dictionary I'm creating myself. I just want to convert it to a pandas data frame. That is why I'm doing that. And so for the year column, I have this. And this population, um, see when I call the data frame like this, this is a data frame and I pass in a particular column to give me data for that column. So I'm getting all the data for all the columns 
in this. So it's return the data in the 1970 population and the 2020 population for me. So I have it here like this. And then what I can do is to say that um, maybe population underscore df, that should be equal to pd dot, we have pandas imported, data frame, and then we pass in the selection. Just to confirm that, okay, pandas is selected, uh, it's imported. And then now I can pass in this uh, to the st dot, dot bar. So data is called to population df. When I save it, okay, it's bringing up another error. Okay, is it that string has no attribute I lock? Oh, sorry, this one should be outside of it. Sorry. Okay, so now we have our um, I don't really like this chat <laughs> and how it is presenting itself but it should it should change if i change the country so that it is changing but i don't really like it how it is representing itself um, so what i'll do is let me change it here so instead of using uh sometimes that's what counts when you use the default one that counts with streamlate so i'll create my own chart and then add it and so what I can say is that the figure equal to, and then I can say, uh, I think that import, did I, I think I installed Plotly. I like that package for plotting. So I can say import Plotly.express not exceptions, the express. If you want to use that one for your chart, fine. I showed you how you can use Matplotlib to do that, but I like Plotly. But if you want to use this Plotly, fine, you can install it also. Plotly express as, sorry, as PX. Okay. And so that one, when I come down, I can see um, this should be PX dot bar. And then I can pass the popu population this thing df, and then I can pass in a couple of things. I can say that the x equal to my year column. Remember here that my column is year, so x equal to year. And then the y equal to, oh, I really don't like what this thing is doing. The y, that should be equal to population. That is how we named it, so. Okay, and um, let me see. Let's save it and see. Okay, okay, we have to show it. So that should be st dot plotly plotly chart. And I pass in the figure. Uh, let me make tell it to use container with okay plotly chart figure, and then use container with set that one to true. What that, what that means is that I should use the available width there. So now you see that it's, this one is giving me a proper chart. Uh, okay, a more beautiful chart than the one in the ST was giving me. Okay, so now this one even has a lot of things you can download as PNG and all that. So that's why I prefer the plot. So if I change uh, to Colombia, it looks like every country's own, but you may think it is not changing because this bar is always high, but if you look at the left side here, the, the numbers will be changing. So if I choose on the Central African Republic, 
and all that. You see that it was five million now, and then um, this one also shot up and all that. So um, it's something like this. If you want to get the data from it and then work with it, you can do it that way. So in the same manner, you can come here. Um, and since we installed the ST Folium, did I show how to use it? I don't think so. I don't think so. So let me show how to use that one. And then we'll close for today. So inside the get data, I will let it return two things. This is um, geo underscore URL. And then I'll come here. into this folder, into the world, GeoJSON, and come to raw, because I want the raw link. So I copy that one also, and then paste it in. Then let me come back. And then after Pandas has read it, what I also want to do is to um, say gpd.read underscore file, and that would be geo underscore URL. OK. And then I'll return DF and OK, this one should be G, GDF, GDF. So I'll return DF and GDF so that I can use them, GDF. Because I'm returning two things, let me do it this way. So data, and then here I can say geo. Data, something like that. Um, I have to correct the spelling here. Um, are there any questions at this point? Let me see. No questions, thank you. So this is it, I'm fetching the two files from the URL. When I save my, my work, nothing has changed because uh, obviously nothing has changed. Okay, and I, I think that it still works. So let's see how we can also add a map here. And I just want to get this indentation. And then if country is not none, Uh, and then we need folium at the top. Let me import folium. So import folium. And then we also need to import st folium. I think it is stream with folium. Yes. As st, rather. Sorry. Folium as ST, so this one as SF, sorry, Streamlit Folium as SF. And then we can come here and see, I'm doing all of this inside the if statement, just to make the code safe. So maybe I can say map here. And then now that I have it, our normal Folium stuff, you can say map is go to Folium dot map, sorry, the capital M. And then uh, we can pass in other stuff too, like that. Uh, but I'll leave it this way. And then folium.geojson, you know how we're adding stuff like that. So geojson. And then the data here equal to 
Dieu d'État, Dieu d'État, and then dots add to, and then I'm adding it to the map, just like we have been doing with folio. But this one, um, also we have to say um, ST, did you say, how did you call it? Is it SF? And then we pass in the map objects. And then you can specify an optional weight and height, but I'll not do that for now. If I do say model object is not callable. Okay. I think we have to ST folium. Import ST folio. Okay, 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 okay. It's rather from, or we can even maintain it that way. So SF dot, and there's a, a, a method in there called ST folio. That is what we are supposed to import do. So ST folio. And this one should render our map for us. Okay, why is it not showing? Okay, I don't know whether it's because of the importation, so maybe from Stream late folium. We want to import S T folium, and then here we can use the S T folium directly. Maybe. Okay, so now now that we called it directly, it came. So yes, this is it. But for your work, you will do something like this, but you only call a specific. So depending on the country that the person selects, so for this case, if I come in here and select Angola, it should change the plot for me. And it should also take me to Angola, zoom into Angola, and even show other stuff about Angola for me. So that is it also how to use the map or the folium package in um, our Streamlit application. Um, I just hope that you've gotten a fair idea of what the streamlet is. If you have any questions, I would love to address them. Other than that, you should close chapter on today. But as I promised, I will um, do a demo of the app as I expect it from you, the functionalities. And I'll also show you how to deploy it, get it to GitHub, and then deploy it. Um, I think if we add this one down to this stream, it will be a bit longer. So I'll do that demo for you. You can expect that maybe tomorrow. But if there are questions, I will address them. If not, then we close chapter for today. OK, so there are no questions. Thank you for your time, as always. And uh, for those of you who are still in the day, have a great day. And um, have a good night, all of us who have to retire to bed. Until next time, it is goodbye.